Good evening or morning or afternoon, wherever anybody is. It's the Allison and Eric show. Eric, it is happy hour officially. Oh, oh, wow. What did you bring? <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude, I brought smart mouth and I hope to live up to my claim here. It's a local brewery. IPA, very fine. I am a huge fan of IPAs. I don't know what that says about me. Uh, I'd like to see everybody in the comment telling me what you brought for happy hour. You don't have to tell us if it's six o'clock in the morning, wherever you are. I am drinking a Malbec from Argentina. Sort of snobby about uh, elevation and whatnot. I'm sure that doesn't surprise anybody who knows me or has been following my channel. <laughs> that... I try to be as healthy as I can, even with my vices. And so I have read and talked to doctors about um, the antioxidants in wine that's grown at very high elevations, also like less pesticide use. And so apparently it's healthier to drink high altitude wine. I don't know. Let's have a discussion about this. Um, <laughs> Courtney Grace brought coffee. So here we go. Oh, here I'm, Courtney, yeah, Courtney's I'm going to. F and vodka. <laughs> Is that a brand or reality? Let's I see. love it. John Paxton. I know John. Okay. Yeah. We got some coffee here. We got vodka, orange juice. Black rifle. What is Blanton's? I don't know what that is. <clears throat> I'm not sure. Uh, the theme. I don't know what diet. that means. Black rifle coffee with lots of cream and sugar. We have some of that in our house. I don't put sugar in my coffee, but I do use cream. What about you, Eric? What do you, how do you make your coffee? Uh, cream. Okay, same here. I actually... And not bulletproof or any of that garbage. Just, just <laughs> cream. I have started using Laird's Superfood Creamer, which does have some coconut sugar in it, but also has other stuff, <laughs> allegedly, that keeps your energy up besides the caffeine. So, And I highly recommend, I I've said this before on other live streams, Laird's uh, Functional Mushroom Coffee. So this guy, Laird Hamilton, you know, he's a surfer, and so he puts mushroom... Yeah, yeah ground up in i'm starting to sound a lot like joe rogan i feel like with with just <laughs> yeah you're, you're getting you're going down a path with, here <laughs> hey are we on rich roll here are you vegan? one one hundredth <laughs> of the following um adam's bots boston lager wow we have a lot of that we need to go through canada dry because i'm trying not to be diet really? because i'm trying not to be a fatty Wait. seltzer ipa increased patriotism in america <laughs> Um, I'm a student, so boxed wine, no, no harm there. If your head can handle it the next day, then go for it. Zima, Sam Adams, we're going to do that one. Um, scotch, Pepsi. All right. We got a lot of, a lot of drinking going on here. So, um, you know, I've watched Scott Adams, the Dilbert guy, right? Yes. Every once in a while in the morning and he does the universal or, or just, oh, the simultaneous, the simultaneous... he's a hypnotist. I, I did a video on him, how it, he says he's a hypnotist as often as Ben Shapiro says he has a doctor for a while. Somebody said that I that's when I say back when I was in mainstream media that it's the same as when Ben Shapiro says my wife is a doctor. <laughs> and I oh, wow. I try to remind people though that there are new folks coming to the channel and they maybe wonder why is this person ranting about mainstream media and what right does she have? And so I have to regularly say I do have It's your teacher. Yeah, I have a background in it. So all right, well we should do a simultaneous sip. So here we go. Sold. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Here's to no more censorship or finding ways around it. Anyway, uh, yeah. Eric and I are going to be talking about all of our gripes with censorship, including self-censorship, which is a favorite topic of Eric's. If you all don't know Eric, <laughs> Eric hosts the Unstructured podcast and has really amazing guests. My favorite one so far that I've watched recently was the guy who left Scientology it was really interesting to hear the stuff that he's he said about it. But I want to give you a second, Eric, in case people don't know who you are, to like just introduce yourself and some of your favorite guests. And you can find Eric's link for his channel in the description. So take it away, Eric. Uh, I host a podcast, Unstructured, and then it turned into a YouTube channel, which is just under my name, Eric Hunley. Everybody can find it there. I live vicariously through other people like the great Alison Morrow. Here. <laughs> I actually am nobody who does nothing. I am a IT professional who works with databases and stuff. And I'm just very curious. And I like to interview a lot of different people, 
who have done really amazing things. I have uh, FBI agents, CIA officers. By the way, it's officers, not agents. I learned that one, and it would be kind of embarrassing to get that wrong. Uh, DEA people. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen um, Narcos on Netflix, but both the original DEA agents who were in that have been on the show. I interview a lot of lawyers. I'm kind of friends with uh, Viva Fry, who has a giant YouTube channel and is just an amazing person. Robert Barnes, his partner, many other people. So I don't, I just inter scratch my own itch, interview a lot of different people and try to bring the expertise that I only wish that I had in this world. Like Allison, she's an expert. I bring her <laughs> yeah. on and I say, Look, I can hang with a journalist and pretend that I know what I'm talking about in journalism. Well, you know what? Thank you for segueing into our first topic because you and I had this discussion about what what is uh, a journalist? And, you know, you have folks who were journalists getting into the YouTube world and sometimes then doing commentary like I do. And you and I were talking kind of behind the scenes about how to explain to people who kind of come to you and your channel as they know you were a journalist, you were in mainstream media, but you're really kind of straddling these two worlds, analysis and commentary, and also sometimes doing journalism. So curious, Eric, just what do you think I do on my channel? Because I've had discussions in the chat <laughs> about it, and there's all this debate about what is journalism, and, and can you even have objectivity? And then, then we're going to, once we, I think, tackle this topic, we can get into then what is editorializing then and what is suppression of speech and censorship and all that stuff. I would like to say first that uh, Lynn has bought the first super chat of the night, the first beer. I'm breaking out some maker's mark right now. It may be that he's already had some maker's mark because I think he spelled some incorrectly S I M. I don't know. Maybe that was on purpose or maybe he's drunk. <laughs> Not sure. And then Eric, I would like to say also that we have a uh, shout out to you. Busha Busha says, Eric well, has you. a great podcast, a must watch. So Eric, what do you think journalism is? And, oh, and then here, here's one more to no spam. I bought, I brought bourbon. Yeah. That's, that's Lynn's drink of choice. What, what is journalism and what, what am I doing here? Help me out. I need identity. I need some identity help. Um, okay. Journalism is a wide open question because, uh, I don't, you know, I love to quote books. Yes. And I, I'll throw one out early. I'll pretend I'm Barnes. So my media of the day is uh, Ryan Holiday. Trust me, I'm lying. Now, there's many other books about it, but journalism, and we'll put quotation marks, has been all over the map. So if you look at, like, say, the election of 1800, and by the way, it's not that far distant because the recent times have not even been as bad as that. You had partisan writers. So you would have people who were writing for one side and writing for the other side. And these partisan hacks would be delivering whatever message it was. And this typically was uh, all across the nation. You'd have two newspapers in almost every city. So you would have, we would call it now like left wing and right wing, but you know, it was just whatever competing factions there were at the time. So I don't want to get caught into left and right, especially now when I think it's more top and bottom. And we can go into that later. But essentially, that existed all the way through the early 20th century when you have um, William Randolph Hearst and um, Joseph Pulitzer. And I don't know if you remember the quotation of never fight a man who buys ink by a barrel. I don't think I, I don't think I've heard that before. Yeah, I think that was William Randolph Hearst, but it was like, you know, people in the conflicts, he's like, never fight a man who buys ink by a barrel. In other words, he's got all the newspaper, all the press. You know who I, then, you know, Eric, real fast, who I okay. found to be very adversarial towards Hearst and help me with the history behind this, if you know it, are uh, cannabis growers, <laughs> because they, they allege <laughs> that there was like this competition between trees and hemp. It, can somebody help me with this in the comment section or Eric, do you know anything about this? Because I, I know I don't, but they, you do or don't. <laughs> I, know there's, I do not personally, we need to but research I guarantee this. there's some cannabis knowledge. Yeah. I, who, who, uh, 
no I, I know as somebody who, when I first moved to Seattle before I took over the environmental beat, I happened to move there at the same time that cannabis was legalized for recreational use in Washington state. Uh, and so I showed up as this journalist and they love to talk about the, how journalists screwed cannabis basically with hearse. Like, I, and it was fascinating because it was like the printing press and paper and trees and they didn't want hemp and they screwed the hemp growers out of everything. And Anyway, it's happy hour, guys. Don't quote me on this, but I was just curious if anybody had heard of it. Continue on. Well, Sorry. There's a ton of racism involved, too, with um, hemp and heroin, everything else. There's a ton of racism involved and is a way to sublimate different uh, cultures in mm. America. That, that, that's kind of been proven. I did not know that um, either. The CIA was behind the crack cocaine epidemic in the uh, 90s. I don't know if you've ever heard of Gary Webb. He was a journalist in uh, Los Angeles. Very famous because he managed to commit suicide by shooting himself in the head twice. Like Epstein. Oh, well, Epstein, yeah, he strangled himself somehow. <laughs> but yeah, Webb actually did two to the head. So that's all I actually kind of yeah. I mean, two to the head. If you yeah. ever hear that, <laughs> it's Gary Webb who killed himself by shooting himself twice. Yeah. Which is an It's weird, though, when you're bringing up, and I know we're kind of off topic, when you're bringing up racism and drugs – then you, I've, I've been hearing a lot about the war on drugs too lately and the issues with that. Sure. And it just, it, it's, it's just a very, I feel like if I were to spend the next 10 years researching something, I think I would want to research drugs and society. I don't know. Guess what? You just scratch the surface. I mean, just research the CIA and drug involvement. And I mean, I just know kind of tangentially, but it's ugly. I mean, it is ugly. You can find every drug crisis with the rise and fall of CIA factions. And it does seem like, Seriously. too, thinking about foreign conflict, too, and I know some of our foreign conflict has obviously had to do with oil, but I have also heard reports about, say, in places like Afghanistan. Central banking over oil, even. Believe it or not, central banking um, over oil. O o oil's cool. And it's a resource, but central banking surprisingly comes into effect more. Like, I think every country we've warred with has turned down um, essentially international bankers. I do also, though, remember back to the drug conversation. I absolutely believe that, what you're saying. Um, but back to the drug conversation, like, too, as it relates to all of this, I've read stuff about, like, burning fields of poppies in Afghanistan, for instance, sure. and uh, getting mm -hmm. the advantage on that. I, it. Anyway, this is all just to say, <laughs> a lot of times people ask me, why don't you talk about this? Why don't you talk about that? And when you talk to somebody like Eric, for instance, or really, um, you know, <laughs> somebody who has who has had the plethora of people on like you have, which I partially think maybe that's why Rogan, who is self, self-reported, self like not, you know, necessarily a PhD in anything, but he gets to talk to these really interesting people all the time, and so do you. And so you get this wealth of information, which is really helpful. But when people ask me, like, why don't you know talk about all these things? Because as you're saying, you can, there are so many things we do not know. And the second you think you know about something, like take QAnon, for instance, I'm, I, I think there's a ton of stuff out there. People have spent years researching, on, yeah, and still have barely scratched the surface. <laughs> But that brings us to censorship. So, but we haven't still haven't even answered the question about journalism. So, what's journalism? Right. Well, see, that's what I was. Going. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm Continue. When you said I get to interview all the different people and talk to this stuff, I could throw out every wild speculation I want to, because I don't claim to have an, you know any kind of journalistic integrity. I try to have personal integrity and in saying this is my opinion or what I think or I heard this. You have actually been working and trained to a standard, which I think is slipped. So I would actually call you a commentary channel who attempts to have journalistic integrity, or I'll say old fashioned journalist integrity, because now it's almost precious. <laughs> Hang on, Eric, I'm going to pull up this chat. Okay. Well, I, so, so I agree with you. I think I, A, what you're saying about trying to hold to the same standards, I do, that's partially why I don't necessarily turn out as much material as some others, simply because I like to do a lot of research. And it's also why I'm very careful about the topics I choose, because I want to make sure that I'm not just saying whatever somebody else read in a particular mm -hmm. outlet, because anyone could go do that. So it, so so that's how I, I'm very choosy about the stuff that I talk about, simply because I do take it very seriously if... 
I end up saying something incorrect or uh, I speculate on something that ends up being wrong. Um, or I, you know, I speculate in a way that that makes things worse for our communities. I, I take all that seriously because I, I took that seriously in the news business. The way that I, I, I reported the news, I wanted it to add a positive benefit for the community not even if that that was hard conversations it doesn't necessarily mean that positive additions to a community are always easy but they can be difficult conversations that need to be had but done in a way that doesn't you know for instance create like more um uh unnecessary or even false narratives about like the other as you're often told right and so that we end up being more skeptical of our neighbors and we can't talk to each other anymore and we're not really understanding what's what's underneath all this stuff um i do i do try when i do interviews about topics like the independent journalists that i've had on the channel who were at the capitol riot for instance or been covering um antifa or the proud boys or whoever else to sort of switch modes from the commentary and just do interviews the way that i would have done them back in the day to understand where they're coming from or say that church pastor, for instance, that, well, he wasn't the actual pastor, but the guy that was working with the church that was fined a million dollars or a little bit more than a million dollars for breaking the COVID rules. Um, I try to still look at it critically and, and detach from my own thoughts and opinions on it simply because I, I don't know, it's hard to turn that off once you've been doing it for almost 20 years. So. Right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt and I'm going to spoil something for everybody. Yeah. Alice texts with me a lot. Yeah. Allison. <laughs> eaten alive by trying to do the right thing oh that's true and i i really deeply appreciate your integrity and sorry to interrupt you but i just thought it's important to share that and and you actually perfectly the other day actually it, you know summed up the difference between us inadvertently because you asked about a guest you had on and you said he said something would you have edited that mm -hmm. out and i said yeah probably because i don't think it added to the conversation and you said, yeah, but isn't that kind of a censorship too? And I had no words. I was like, oh shit, integrity just slapped yeah. me in the face. What am I gonna do here? Because I tried to say I have integrity and I just got called out on this particular moment and it is a hard call. And I do wanna talk to you about that because there's the whole editing principle mm -hmm. of, when I was editing interviews, especially, and I think you might agree with this, academics, have you noticed that academics are the most obnoxious people to pull quotes because they always state half of a thought, back up, repeat, and then start over and say the thought again? So it's really funny you bring this up because I don't want to slam all academics because I, you know, I got to go to graduate school and everything, oh, right? And, and you and you have academics on your channel and, and they offer some, right? And, and what is an academic, sure. right? Okay, so let, let, that's, my, that's my first pre-qualification. Like, we're not trying to say all, 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 but... That said, as somebody who does have a lot of buddies who are working in higher education, yeah, it's it's really interesting. In some cases, the it it almost makes things worse for their ability to deal with their own issues because they can vicariously live almost like a psychotherapist who hasn't dealt with their issues. They can live through the thoughts of another person. So if you consider an academic, say in the, the liberal arts, like I have a buddy who's... <laughs> I hope her husband's not watching. Well, ex-husband, ex-husband now. Um, but you know, he he's a professor in the liberal arts, and um, and and he could quote you any of the greatest thinkers of our time. I mean, we're talking everybody from Foucault to Nietzsche to Kant, you know, dating all the way back to sure. Socrates and Plato, and even before that, probably. And and I really think like just talking to, to some folks in the same way, like I have a master's degree in psychology and counseling, a master divinity degree with specialization in psychology and counseling. I almost got into that field because I was dealing really with the fact that my brother was uh, struggling with addiction and I wanted to help addicts because I couldn't help my brother. And thankfully I had a very smart professor who noticed that and was like, maybe you should go to therapy and deal with that. And then when I did, I didn't want to be a counselor anymore. I didn't want to work out my issues through other people. And to your point about the academics, I found that there's a lot of a lot of people who it's like a way to dissociate, but still kind of feel through your problems and your issues and think through big questions without ever actually having to put a stake in the ground on what you believe, because you can just throw things out there and and kind of smoke and mirrors people and even yourself. 
and and feel like you're in the game when really you're just recycling someone else's talking point. So I, I totally agree with you. Right. And then to the editing factor, there's a tendency with an academic to say, I'm about to say, about to say, I'm about to say fill in the blank. And when I'm editing that, the first two about to say is probably are not adding to the content. So I have in my mind a little bit of the whole, okay, they sound stupid or they don't, if not stupid, they just don't sound as good as they are. Their message is in the third sentence, which is complete. The first two are incomplete. Let me just drop it. So there is a factor of editing in my mind that is not necessarily trying to censor information, but just kind of going, does this add to the content or does it not? Now, the example you pointed out was me going a little bit farther saying, this is extraneous. It's probably stupid. I'll just take it out. But there's a fine line in there. So there's the line of clearing it up for clarity and to you know, clarity and brevity because there's attention span issues. And then there's the whole, oh, there's content here that could tell you something about the person who said this remark that maybe people should know. And I think that's a, an interesting, interesting place to go because we're always thinking about, oh, look, you're trying to bury this negative thought or this message you don't agree with. Well, there's also the thing of, what if you do agree with somebody and you want to clean up their language to make sure they sound as good as possible because you want their message to come through? That's a, another form of manipulation. Well, what you were bringing up there and, you know, without getting into the specifics of the interview that you're talking about that you and I kind of went back and forth on, as you were saying, there's, there's a difference between this person just kind of rambling and off topic and this person said something that makes me uncomfortable. And, and the reason that I was texting you was not because it made me uncomfortable, really, because I've listened to so many people that it's very hard to make me feel uncomfortable nowadays, but, um, but it made viewers uncomfortable and they wrote that. Right. And, and so I was like, ah, would you have edited that out? Because it really, you're right in one way, it wasn't necessarily specifically necessary to understanding the, the topic of conversation. However, it did give you insight into the way that that person looks at the world and what's going on. To me, it I left it in because frankly, if I find myself saying, ah, uh, I don't like that that person said that, but it's not, but it's on topic, but it's just that I didn't like it. I will usually leave it in because I don't want to be that person, right? It's like, it's a slippery slope. And frankly, I want you to understand that there's context and, and, uh, nuance to how people think through things. And if that helps you, even if it's something you don't like, you're like, okay, now I can see how that person thinks that then I've robbed you of that by taking that out. Even if it made me uncomfortable, even though that may be an ad hominem right. in, in, in terms of the thought, it would be like, Oh, well they're disgusting or annoying, which has nothing to do with the point that they make, which could be a hundred percent valid. Yep. And again, we get into that because today's world, I mean, how much have we heard that? It's like, Oh, you can't listen to them. They're about right. blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, wait a minute. Did what they say, is that true? Is there veracity? Yes right. or no? So I, I totally get it. It's it's tricky. And I admit that I'm on the other end to where I have a little bit more flexibility because, again, I'm not a journalist. <laughs> I'm a hack. Well, you're not a hack. But I, I do, even though I think I probably could – Lynn gets on my case about this a lot because he thinks I should be a little bit more, you know, um, not such a fence rider, I guess, but I'm just not there yet. I, I'm still at the point where I really just want to give you some background and analysis from stuff that I think would be important about becoming a better consumer of the news. I also use my channel to try to hopefully if there are journalists paying attention, maybe they'll take to heart some of what I have to say. Uh, but How's that working out? Yeah, I have like three journalists, I think, that follow me <laughs> that like what I'm doing. I think the rest, I'm still. <laughs> you haven't gotten angry. No. Yet. You haven't really gotten angry. Me? I, I think that's the, uh, yeah, I, I don't think you've really just been like, okay, this is yeah. bullshit or, you know, <laughs> or, or whatever it is and just said, 
There is a lot of bullshit, but I, there's also a lot of anger out there, and I don't want to add to people having <laughs> overreactions. Not, and I want to say, not that calling it for what it is is an overreaction. That's not what I mean. But there's a there's a way to make change and to have uh to have a a realistic understanding of what's going on so that you can make that change which i think can get clouded sometimes when we get really emotional about topics and we've seen that over the last year and it's something like lynn talks okay. about too this uh combat cocktail right that he he says you get all like when you're really afraid and you have the fight or flight stuff going that it, it's almost like being drunk and i'm sure i'm butchering this but that it to me it's like there's enough of that out there enough of people trying to get you really hysterical and i'm i really want to keep people calm enough to think logically about what's happening so that we can make an actual change and not just scream at the wall which that's fine too sometimes you just got to do that i guess but yeah, I, I, it's not that I don't get real, I, I don't, in other words, don't mistake the fact that I don't get irate for the fact that I don't take it very seriously. I do take the mess that mainstream oh, like media is in extremely seriously. Um, I just, I want to be able to be heard too by my peers. And I know if I just started going on all these rants as well, it wouldn't serve that purpose as well. Really fast, Bob Wildfish says, I never got a text from you unlike your guest, but I can tell you're a good egg. When you're wrong, it's because you lack information, right. not because you have nefarious intent. Well, thank you. I guess that's an indirect way to say that I'm wrong on a regular basis or not. I don't know. <laughs> but at least I try, right? Uh -oh. um, okay, let's... I did want to show a couple of these things about Hearst because there was some interesting information. I did put them up on the, the screen here, but uh, let's see. Well, first off, hemp is related to cannabis. It does not get you high. Hemp is used for, I think this would be hemp, right. is used for a lot of product paper, rope, clothes. Yes. Oh. One of the cool things that I learned about hemp when I was covering the environment is that it does a lot of soil remediation naturally. It's really good at pulling toxins out of the ground. And there were people that were working on pilot programs to see how if you could plant hemp in areas where there's been historical, you know, chemicals, pollution, that kind of stuff, to use that for cleanups and then also get a product out of it. So that was something, but everybody gets freaked out because what if the seeds blow through the air and then they cross pollinate with whatever. So anyway, it's, it's always politics. I feel like. Yeah. Everybody's seen reefer madness too many yeah. times. I, I need to go watch that. Um, Hearst papers. Definitely. No, no, I haven't seen pretty much every movie oh other God. than um, star Wars. Well, okay. Reefer madness is a short that was, you know, played before movies in the thirties and forties. And it is, it is quite hilarious. I mean, it's probably 10 minutes. Okay, then I definitely need to watch it. I have no excuse. Um, here we go. Both of you do great work. And then somebody did say that Hearst definitely had a role in getting hemp um, removed from the, the commercial world. But I, I definitely need to go do some more research on that. Being truthful and finding the facts is a rare commodity nowadays. And let's see, hate that I was here, but couldn't watch as it started as a more important to me stream was still live. I, I'm wondering who's, whose live stream is more important than ours, Eric? Could it be Tim Pool's? I know, it can't be Tim Pool. <laughs> I always compete with that and guy. Beavis off today. Um, the green... Hey, Aviva's not on. Come yeah, on come on. What are you, you're not going to see Eric on Tim Pool. So the green butt of today is not the same stuff I had as a kid. That's probably true. My, um, I do have a family oh, member sure. who grows it. Uh, for medicinal uh, stuff. And and it's really interesting. I, I learned a ton. I, literally to this day, I still have never smoked pot or tried marijuana in any way. And yet I'm a total believer in a lot of the medicinal uses for it. Though I do think like having read up on on medical practitioners who use it, it does seem like there is there's important research to be done and use within a certain um, world, right? And that they are actually concerned about recreational kind of moving the the 
the genetics towards a just get high kind of McDonaldization of cannabis um, when these strains are very different, the stuff you use for medicinal purposes versus recreational. And Bob says, there was nothing negative in my comment. What does it say about your psychology that you read into an assumption <laughs> about you often being wrong? Let's not go there. What do you think, Eric? <laughs> I, I've actually, okay, back to the weed and the dangers or whatever. I, I've actually had on a dispenser who does medical marijuana or weed or whatever in Canada. Mm -hmm. And he is very much concerned about people who treat cannabis as if it's going to cure everything. It's like, oh, if you have cancer, it's effective. If you have this, it's effective. And he's like, that's a very dangerous road to go down. It It is a tool. It has its purposes, just like every other you know, substance that is out there. And this is somebody who literally, you know, that's how he makes his living. It's um, Warren Bravo Green Relief is his company. It's a, a podcast. You've mentioned I have a lot of people I interview. I, I had a podcast since 2018 where I interviewed a lot of people. So some of these folks kind of have come back because of the podcast exposure or I've built up connections over time. That's how you know an honest broker when they will tell you the that their product is not going to cure everything. Just like I used to want people who are selling Priuses 10 years ago to just be more honest about what a Prius was going to get you environmentally. I know we've made extreme um, progress in that area, but back in the day, it was it was not necessarily already, what they were selling you was not yet what you were getting, I believe. And a friend of mine said back then, the danger of that is that then you create skeptics that are like never going to come back to the market. And if you're just honest about Hey, maybe, you know, eventually we get to the point where the electrical grid is going to be greener. And so this will be worth it more, or you'll have more um, stops along the way, you know, more plugins or whatever else. Uh, so invest in it, you know, choose it, say it that way, market it that way. Like it's an investment for the future or something better than immediately right now. So, so I, I think that's cool that the person you interviewed um, said that. And we do have an answer to who the competition is. That would be Matt Christensen is on right now. And Interestingly, oh, he's big time. Yeah, I believe Matt. He's always on though. I'm never on with Allison. Come yeah, on, guys. seriously. And he, I, I don't know if he always does his live streams with her, but somebody named Blonde, who's in Seattle, Beauty and the Blonde, or Beast and the Blonde, or, yeah, yeah, something. Like blonde in the belly of the beast. So obviously, we have all the same things plus more. All right, so now we, we need to get into the. Um... <laughs> oh, while we're griping about the environmental yeah. hacks there. First off, have you seen South Park where they cover the uh, neighbor who got the Prius? No, but I've seen weeds where they were using the Prius for drug dealing because it's the quietest car out there and you can sneak up on oh, people. Oh, there you go. Uh, that was an amazing the, episode. The South Park had the guy driving by and he always looked out his window and said, I'm driving a Prius because I'm doing my part. <laughs> and yeah. where I'm going with this is that people were buying Prii. I don't know if that's the plural, but I'm going with it. It works for me. Um, especially because... It was the name of the vehicle. It wasn't that they gave a shit about a hybrid vehicle or anything else. They had the same problem in Berkeley when they were getting subsidies for um, solar panels on the roof. People were always installing them on the street side. And half the time, that was screwed up because the sun wouldn't be properly aligned on the street side, but they wouldn't put it on the back side because people wouldn't see that they had the stupid solar panel. <laughs> so some of this stuff is all about impress impressing your neighbor yeah. or showing... You know, I'm sorry, virtue signaling, which I know I've talked to you about virtue signaling. Uh, yeah, well, you it's hard to get through a talk about politics in today's world or media, for that matter, without using that phrase. It's something that I didn't know about, frankly, until I got into the YouTube world. It's funny how many things as a mainstream journalist I was totally unaware of. The conversations for sort of the social revolutions that were happening the criticisms of mainstream news, even though I kind of, obviously I knew we weren't the most popular people on the face of the earth. Cause I was at protests where people would make that very clear, but I, I learned so much by getting into the new media world, the internet world, simply because of these conversations that you can have, which are a lot longer and more contextualized mm -hmm. and nuanced. And people can just be more honest about what they're thinking. And, and so, uh, and there's a chat to call you out. Yeah. That's your account. Yeah, that's your editor. <laughs> that's your editor. Oh, no, it kind of it kind of is. It's like you're not going to go too far down because the chat's over there going to be like, you're full of yeah. shit. 
you're a liar. You're a liar. Yeah. You're dumb. You're dumb. And it's like, okay, <laughs> uh, let me address that right now before this goes off the rails. So that was the interesting thing, though, like when when you're moving into this world, and I'm curious because it kind of goes back to that censorship conversation and this self-censorship part, which I wanted you to talk about, Eric, since that was something that you wanted to discuss. Um, when you're talking about virtue signaling, what is the role of virtue signaling when it comes to self-censorship? In other words, is self-censorship the negative form of virtue signaling? In other words, I'm not saying that because I'm virtue signaling. I don't want I don't want to say that because I don't want you to think less of me whereas virtue signaling is the I want you to think more of me. What do you think about that? Okay, first off, I had called on. I guess Reefer Madness is 66 minutes. Maybe I was stoned when I watched it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, <laughs> the chat, see? The chat's going to call me there out. There you go. Okay. It's a really interesting question about virtue signaling and self-censorship. I would say that self-censorship is in the middle. Virtue signaling is me saying, look, Allison, I had such and such on because I think it's very important. We talk about the spotted owl or, or fill in the blank. It's very meaningful for me. And, you know, many people would call me a male feminist, by the way, because I just really care about it. That's all virtue signaling. It's like, Stuff that is going to win me little points, like if we've got a bingo ticker of, you know, how I'm a good person, we get the line out, somebody's going to yell bingo. Self-censorship, on the other hand, is the whole, I don't want to be the target of any kind of SJW or social justice warrior or anything else. I just kind of want to do my thing. I'd like to put out a video. And we can talk about this too. I, I put out live streams. I literally had one last week. I had Nate Brody and David Fryheit, aka Viva Fry on. I turned on monetization. I started the live stream. I looked at it in the background. And all of a sudden, the dollar sign went pink, yellow, immediately. Uh. So it's demonetized before we even said anything. We didn't get anywhere into it. And what does that do to me as a creator? Now, I try to have integrity say, oh, hell no. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. But it's like, well, you know, I'd kind of like to earn a couple dollars on this video if possible. It would be really nice if, if it got sent out to an audience because I don't really want to be alone in the room talking to myself like I'm insane. So I might, I might hold back a little bit. I might just not be quite as aggressive on a subject or, or maybe one of them is saying something about, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but you know, yeah, you know, wait, 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 yeah, yeah. Let, let's change the subject. That to me is self-censorship. And I think that all uh -huh. of us and David and I, Viva and I have talked about that ourselves too, where he deals with that. And then there's the flip side, like I might have some people who are very anti uh, PC, very anti that. And I'll bring somebody on that's, let's say, a leftist who writes about QAnon and they're writing it pretty much and they believe every kind of anti Trump thing out there, every meme. So they're sort of a conspiracy theorist themselves who's an anti conspiracy theorist. Well, I'm going to get beat up by my audience by having somebody here or on the show that goes against, let's say, a, a meme that they appreciate or, or something that we all seem to be in alignment with. Even though I, I'm not trying to be specifically in alignment, I'm trying to be honest and give different views, I look at it and I go, oh, shh. <laughs> Everybody's going to be pissed about that. I think you went through that, actually. You had a guest who started a call. You're, uh, many people in your audience, Nazis. <laughs> Did he and call them Nazis or did he just call Trump Hitler? I don't really remember. I'm kind of still blanking well, on that. Way, he kind of, <laughs> he, he went down a path and I saw your face <sighs> and I, we we all look at something called Social Blade. We're always trying to build the channel. I mean, to be honest and upright, you know, <laughs> if we don't grow, we don't get subscribers, we don't get this and that, then we're just kind of dead in the water. And a tool called Social Blade, we look at it and we say, oh, look, it's ticking up. It's nice. And then and then we get a YouTuber that pisses us off or something. We look at him and we're like, oh, look at that. They lost X number on Social Blade. And I watched 
Allison's face, and it was priceless because I could just see the social blade graph in her eyes going. Oh. <laughs> well, people were there literally we saying All in the chat, Allison. The chat's lighting <laughs> yeah. up. Allison lost thirty subscribers <laughs> in one chat's minute. Lighting up like. <laughs> chat's lighting up like crazy, and Allison's like. And she's trying to kind of not piss off an old friend guest in a way, but also trying to be like, okay, well, I don't agree with this. And I, I, I how do I pull this back in? And, and that's where I really appreciate you for your integrity because I just could see all of it and the struggle and relate to it. So that's self-censorship yeah. in multi levels. Yeah. Well, and to that point, I'm curious have you ever watched a video that you had such an emotional reaction to that you were, I'm going to unsubscribe to this channel because I don't, I don't have that. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that phenomenon because I just, if something, if somebody says something I think is nuts, I just laugh and I move on. I, I don't I get bothered. I'm, follow up. I'm like, why did they do that? Yeah. It just, because if they, if they're against what I see all the time, I'm actually going to be curious because it doesn't, it triggers me wrong. And I, I actually had that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like Scott Adams. We talked about the simultaneous yep. sip, right? I was actually reading Scott Adams' book, Win Bigly, because the election was mm -hmm. coming up and I hadn't gotten around to it. I was like, okay, let me just see what's going to happen here, you know, what he thinks. I, I have, you know, pretty high regard to his opinion. And then he had on somebody, he had Nikki Klein on, who's a high level member of Nexium. And I'm a, I'm kind of an anti-cult guy. I have cult experts on, and he has a, a cult member on and is kind of supporting Wait, her. what was the – I, I heard going, Nexium, which I wait, thought was a, a pharmaceutical company or a pill. I think there was a stick <laughs> pill by that okay. name, too. So I was like, D, does it like pharma? And then you're like, cult. So I guess they're the same. I don't know. <laughs> but, okay, what – I've never heard well, of this they, before. They, you know, they both put people in, <laughs> yeah, in a trance, if you will, and uh, take a <laughs> – uh, take advantage of them, I guess. Anyway, so I was like, this is crazy. And I, I spent a lot of time and I was going to cover the whole thing, but I wound up just targeting one specific point because I was like, what? You're full? No, that's not right. Had some experts, made a video, and then tagged him on it. And he actually talked about it. But I'll still watch him. I disagree with something that he said. And I brought in you know, experts on and confronted, and then when he responded, he said, well, you know, put in the terms with the experts and all that, I would actually agree with them. And they're more knowledgeable than I am. So I, in general, I, I kind of grow weary of people. It's like, if I see something over mm -hmm. and over and over, over time, I'm just like, you know, this is just tiring. It's kind of exhausting. I don't get the message. That's when I unsubscribe. It's like, yeah, I, I keep seeing it in my feed and it's just not really doing it for mm -hmm. me. It, it feels like it's pressure. Then I'll let Yeah, it there are some partisan folks that I've come very close to unsubscribing from simply because I I feel like they're intentionally withholding information and and trying to create controversy that I'm not totally sure exists. And so I feel like you're being disingenuous, then I don't like that. But if you just have a different opinion, I appreciate that. If I feel like you're coming at that opinion with a genuine approach to understanding what's going on, because like I have my own bias, you have your own bias. None of us are free of that. So it'd be dumb for me to right. say I'm unsubscribing because of bias, but if I feel like you're like aware of that, but you're using it to, I don't know, make the world a worse place than it already is, then then I don't, I don't know. I may pay attention to what you're saying simply because I want to know what's going on. I, I want to know the, the cultural context of stuff that I'm reading online or whatever. I, people are going to talk about you. I want to know who you are, but I don't like enjoy it necessarily. I look at it like sitting through a class that I don't really want to be in, but I'm going to pay attention simply because maybe it'll help me think through some stuff, you know, in the future. Um, Courtney Grace, who I know has been basically waiting for the live stream since yesterday or this morning says, Oh, very interesting. What? They definitely seem to be two sides of the same coin. We're talking about self-censorship and virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between self-censoring because of moral standards and appropriateness and self-censoring from fear? Tactfulness versus um, not cause wanting to cause trouble. Interesting mm -hmm. question. I don't know. 
No, I, I would say that if if you were self-censoring to not be offensive to somebody's moral code, like I'm I'm trying not to swear a whole lot here because that that doesn't really get anywhere. I don't know, you know, what your audience, if they appreciate it, don't appreciate that. But I don't think I'm watering down my message in any way by not saying F bombs every two minutes. Not that I do mm -hmm. it anyway, but that would be a good example. Like changing your language to try to mix in with company versus saying, I'm not going to talk about this subject because it's just going to give me too much yeah. grief. So there was, I, I've never talked about this on my channel and I'm not going to go into a lot of details yet about it. Maybe someday I will, I will go into greater detail about something that happened to me back when I was in mainstream media, but somebody said something in my newsroom that was uh, inappropriate. I'll leave it at that. And I reacted, I believe I overreacted emotionally in that I should have waited to think about what I exactly wanted to say instead of, I didn't yell or anything like that. I just, it just came out. Like what you just said was inappropriate and you shouldn't have said it. <laughs> and imagine just saying that to one of your coworkers, right? That you're, you work with on a daily basis. And I think I missed an opportunity to further the conversation, which we could have done and maybe gained something out of it. And instead it, it just became like, awkward. You know what I mean? And so I think about that situation a lot because what I, what I was calling out was absolutely fair. And what that person was saying, I think was dangerous to our newsroom, not, not from a, like a physical standpoint, but from an ideological standpoint. Um, and I'm glad that I said something. I just wish that it's not that I, I would say I needed to self-censor and that I shouldn't have said something at all, but there is a way to be heard right by your audience and sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean you know bending over backwards to be nice and placate and pander or whatever it just means try to get rid of the like the you know crap that makes that may make you say things in a in a tone or a way that hurts your message and like going back to that person that i didn't edit that we were talking about um you know, yeah, if I were to counsel him, I would say, I think what you said made you, made your message kind of get lost in the ethos, you know, or in the, in the atmosphere and people who could have been on your side wouldn't have been on your side. Cause you said that, but then again, I felt like the viewer deserved to see that. And then they could say, well, you know what, uh, that, the, that person's intentions for how they're coming at this is wrong. And I don't, and I'm not on board with them because I don't agree with, with the way they're approaching it. Even if I, I agree with the end game. I don't agree with the way they're getting there. And I think those are important conversations to allow viewers to have, which is why I did not cut that. You just described four years of Trump, by the way. Yeah. I mean, actually that's, that was, that used to be one of my arguments for not censoring him was that I feel like you should know if you, you know, whether you like him or hate him, but say that you really didn't like him. Wouldn't you want people to know like all these terrible things that you think he's saying? Like, wouldn't you want people to know that? That to me, I didn't understand why people wanted to censor him so he sounded better. You know, I, so I was just like, let him let him hang himself. If that's if you guys don't like him, then let him say what he's gonna say and let people see. Why why would you? And, and that's again, it's it's like I don't want to polish somebody up so that they're more acceptable to the people who are watching my videos. If you're not gonna like that person, yeah. I'm gonna let them show you exactly who they're true colors are in fact a very smart viewer said during one of the live streams where i think it was the one the nazi one um it's amazing if you let somebody talk long enough they'll show you their true colors and it's true and that's and that's why i like long form because it's it it shows you a on on the plus side that people who you may have some agreement with in some things you may disagree with entirely on other things which i think is healthy for human beings to understand that there is a cross section of things we agree and disagree with and and not everybody can be boxed as one thing or another. And that's a healthy way to look at the world. And so I don't want to polish somebody up so that they fit into this, this box so that it reinforces that tribalism that I, I don't like. I do want to say, Bob says, don't self-censor, just switch to rumble at all and monetize there. YouTube suppresses lots of facts and science. I do want to get into that in a second. Um, 
And Bob says no. again, I, I, I worked her on. Okay, it. and conspiracy <laughs> theory is just a thought terminating cliche popularized in 1967 by assets of the CIA to discredit anyone asking questions yes. about the JFK death. Yes. You can read about the plans to discredit yes. people asking questions in CIA doc 1035. Hey, wasn't there a lot of angst over the fact that Trump didn't allow for this, the JFK documents to be unclassified or declassified? What, didn't I read something about that? Yeah, there was. And he did a lot of UFO stuff. The funny thing is from what I understand about uh, the JFK things. Have you ever heard of Hamlin's yes. razor? I've heard of Occam's razor too. Okay. Is it the I same thing? To... Not quite. Occam's razor is the uh, simplest answer between two things is usually the right. Um, Hamlin's razor is uh, never ascribed to malice that which can be explained okay, by stupidity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I approach I that sometimes that with the I... media. <laughs> well, no, I, I believe in that you know wholeheartedly all the time. And most conspiracies are really out of Hanlon's razor. And I get the vibe that Kennedy, you know, like a lot of things that go on that went on there potentially were people who dropped the ball on their job. And are you going to talk about how you screwed up and let fill in the blank screw up and it's going to hose your career? Or are you going to shut your mouth, shut this investigation down? And let's say there's uh, many people who screw up a lot. That I think I get the vibe that that's kind of what maybe happened there. Um, your super chatter though about the conspiracy theory is absolutely true, and I'm actually reading um, Cheryl Atkinson's book right now, her latest one. I've read the other two, and she was talking about how the term anti-vaxer is another one of those. You know, terms are thrown out to weaponize yeah. and to stop people or make them sound ridiculous. And conspiracy theory is mm -hmm. right in there. Yeah, she was saying something in a tweet I was reading recently, or maybe it was on her website that I clicked on after clicking on her tweet, about when you're consuming news, one of the things to be aware of is when the when the news piece is being, you know, either it's written or being spoken, is the presenter trying to undermine the character of the person that so they may have their first sentence like blah 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 happened this this thing happened just so you then the second thing is just so you know though this this thing this person is crazy for all these reasons and then then it goes into the next things and and that brings me to I I didn't have it pulled up but J P Sears now in Wikipedia is being called a conspiracy theorist. And I have, you know, <laughs> I share that. Yes. So I want to, yep. I'm going to like pull that up while you're talking about it. But it's funny because a, back when I did my Antifa video, somebody said, I look like the female JP Sears. So if you guys aren't familiar with him, look him up, but mm. he does a lot of comedy. My, the first video I saw of his was about coconut oil and like the American heart association getting things wrong. And <laughs> the guy's harmless. He, he's, he just does funny videos. He, he looks like a yoga instructor who gets into politics every once in a while, but now he's being called a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, pot. yeah, a yoga instructor who smokes a lot of weed. He looks like a burnout <laughs> who's a comedian. He's funny. Yeah, and so it's like when you start calling guys like him dangerous, for instance, so, and this is another thing I was listening to, and I'm curious what, what you think about this too, Eric. I was listening to a very mainline liberal commentator last night talking about the My Pillow guy, and he was trying to make a case for why the My Pillow guy is very dangerous to America. And it was funny because he he had to he backtracked because I think he got some pushback on Twitter. He mentioned that um, that that it's not just because the my pillow guy is dangerous. It's because there are all these other things happening in American culture right now. And so by virtue of having all these other problems, it just makes him even more dangerous. So we got to remove him. It's like, but but where like where do you end this? You know, I mean, at what point in time is American history safe enough? that now you can have people saying things freely, okay? I don't know if there's ever a time in American history where that's going to be the case. But when you're starting to get to the point where it, it, it just is, it's just like the guy with the red hair, the yoga guy that does funny comedy where he pokes at coconut oil and and COVID lockdowns and stuff, he's a conspiracy theorist. I don't even know where we go from here. It's worse than my pillow guy. There's a lot of calls, and it's been amplified by media figures for, quote, deprogramming of people who support Trump. Deprogramming. Yes. Uh, let's just say it's getting to the level where I think they're almost talking about re-education camps. And anybody who's studied a little history and a little Mao 
should probably pay more attention. And this is something that we had talked about previous guests that I've had mm -hmm. on. One of my favorites is Jack Barsky, who was a KGB agent who lived as a mole in the United States for um, 16 years. He ultimately has become an American. He loves America and the U.S. And it was his living here that turned him because he wasn't caught. He wasn't caught until six years after he was done. But he's 70-something years old now. I'm an Xer. I remember essentially um, the Cold War, if you will. I did a little bit of duck and cover, but more and more people and more and more power players do not remember the Cold War. And they're saying, hey, this socialism, communism thing, this is a great idea because, you know, everybody screwed me over and I want somebody to take care of me. You know, I, I grew up, I went to college, I'm in all kinds of debt, everything else. I... I want, you know, somebody to take care of me, damn it. I'm tired. I, I I want the government to take care of me. So it's a very seductive song. And all the Jack Barskys of the world are getting too old for anybody to pay attention to. And that is something that terrifies the hell out of me. And we talked about it a little bit because I think we're missing that out. You're going to find, if you look in world co culture right now, Eastern Europe, let's say Poland, Belarus, a lot of these other countries, people who are from there, you are going to confuse with, quote, right wing nut jobs because they're very concerned about any kind of collectivism. Their families have lived under it. They have a living memory of things that are going on. And that, I think, is a, a very real problem of not having that. I mean, the greatest generation who fought Hitler they're dying. There's very few left. They're all in their 90s, if anybody. And we just, we've lost touch with all of that. And that's kind of bad. I do think that the stuff I've heard about people, you know, the, the searches that employers are doing to find out, you know, I've, and I, like, I've just heard this stuff that people are looking to see, did you vote for Trump? Did you go to DC? Even if you weren't, I know that yeah. is happening, right? You, you were in DC, but you, mm -hmm. maybe you didn't participate in the criminal aspect of the riot. Should you still be fired from your job? I do think it's starting to get a little bit dangerous when you're going to fire people for voting for a presidential candidate, especially when we're talking about millions, you know, tens of millions of people. And, and that's going to bring us back to a very I think, unfortunate place where a lesson could be learned again. I've said this a million times with my old industry, for instance, about how did we get here and taking responsibility for that. And if we keep just wanting to do witch hunts with people that voted for the guy instead of asking, why did they vote for the guy? <laughs> what 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 conditions were set up for this guy to win? Then I feel like you repeat history. Uh, you know, I, I've heard a lot of actually progressive left folks common, you know, doing commentary about this. And they're like, you're going to get a worse Trump if you don't take this seriously. And you know, I think they make a valid point about, sure. you know, you, you're not going to, if you don't solve the problem, just like, like any, any other issue you're dealing with, even personally, it, it, as, as Lynn, my husband says, bad news doesn't get better with time. So you should deal with it. Eric, I, I will read one comment. And then I want to tell you that people are commenting about your shirt. They want to know what is your shirt. But first, this is from Jerome <laughs> Welch. Allison, you should read the book, uh, F Your Fuel. It's written by Barbara the Welder. I haven't read it yet, but I know it's going to be awesome. Self-help motivation. Help us find our edge. Okay, so there's a book recommendation. So, Eric, can you tell us about your shirt, please? Okay. It's uh, from the band Joy Division, the album Unknown Pleasures. It was the only album they made before the lead singer uh, passed away, shall we say. He killed himself in the late 70s. It's uh, one of the more important post-punk pre new wave albums if anybody's heard of new order the uh, band new order came from the remnants of joy division the lead singer killed himself the rest of the band came forth with uh, new order which released blue monday which is one of the largest dance tracks uh, ever written in all time well that was everything i was hoping your shirt was going to be and more um <laughs> so i do have uh us in the bottom screen looking at J.P. Sears Wikipedia, just so I can prove to everybody. J.P. Sears, mm. also uh, born in the same year as Lynn and I, 81. It was a great year. Known online as Awaken with J.P. He is an American YouTuber, comedian, emotional healing and life coach, businessman, and conspiracy theorist. 
<laughs> he's all of those things, but he's also a conspiracy theorist. So it says even that he conspiracy. I think is the new term. Yeah, conspiracy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he. It's funny because I know people who know him and and folks who have had them him on like their live streams and stuff, and they've said about him that he he just doesn't care. He's going to do what he wants to do and say what he believes is true and is going on. And he's not one of those people that's just like, you know, nervous Nelly about what he puts out there, probably like I am. So he did kind of veer from. Which is awesome. Everybody needs to. Yeah, him. I think, you know, people who are willing to stick their neck out, why not? Like I said, you may not agree with everything they say, but it's nice to to have people that are just like, you know what? I, I'm willing. Cause he's had, I think sponsors say they don't want to work with him. This was because he was starting to, criticize like the COVID lockdowns. And then he made some, he does, you know, breaking news videos where he makes fun of the media every once in a while. And he did one about the Capitol and I don't know if that got him in some hot water or not, but it, so he's having the same issues, like sponsors not wanting to work. And then it does start to get concerning if it's all of a sudden now the banking institutions don't want to work with you or, or like, where does this end? Um, that's definitely stifling for free speech, but I wanted to also bring up uh, this too. Okay, so this is the MyPillow announcement. And then what do you think about, I thought this was interesting. This is from CNN talking about um, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene being temporarily suspended from Twitter for election misinformation. Oh. What do you think about that? Oh, she's the one that, they're, that they've that released her following uh, David Hogg around and all of that stuff. Is that I don't know. I just know that she, it says that she has a- The new out of Georgia. Yes, that's her, yeah. Mm -hmm. She has- a track yeah, okay. record of um, incendiary rhetoric and ties to the baseless QAnon conspiracy theory. That's what she, that, and yeah, she. By the way, okay, uh, stop. We got to go with that right okay. there. These are supposedly articles, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's read that. What was that headline again? You mean that sentence that I just read? Green, who has a yeah. track record of incendiary rhetoric and ties to the baseless QAnon conspiracy theory. Now, when did that become news? Well, it. I didn't see, I didn't hear the word alleged in there. So I, I mean, no, you just said it's baseless. You've made a judgment in that sentence. Whoever wrote that right there, that whole sentence is so opinionated that unless it's a column, it's garbage. And I'm tired of seeing that in articles. I see it all the time. Headlines, everything else. Well, I will say that for as far as I don't, I don't know enough about uh, QAnon, though I will say that I've read a ton about some stuff that... <laughs> seems somewhat crazy or very well, crazy, <laughs> but, but, um, sure. but I will say that to, to, to say incendiary rhetoric, that is definitely a, a subjective call because what, what is incendiary to one person is not incendiary to another. So that, that's an example of what you were saying with, uh, Cheryl Atkinson, that, that would be like an example of what, what she was talking about with, with trying to say, you know, project Veritas gets this a lot. They'll say Project Veritas has uncovered this, and then the next sentence will be, "By the way, they use deceptive techniques to get <laughs> to get the information." Sure. So that's so that you'll be like, "Oh, they're deceptive." So, uh, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pay attention to or, this or multi time sued or whatever. Not never mind that they've never been convicted or never had a verdict against against them or yeah, all of these things. It's like that's not actually a statement, and that drives me insane. Because it's so common that it's just, it's flowing like normal words. But these aren't normal. These are opinions that are put in sentences. Opinions of the reporter. I don't want an opinion of a reporter. You're supposed to report. Shut up. Just tell me A, B, and C, not your opinion. Yeah, so you are you saying you would have preferred them to just say um, she has ties to QAnon? Just say that, and so don't call it baseless or, or, or alleged ties to okay QAnon. alleged ties to QAnon. i would say you know a way i would write that is uh marjorie blah 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 whatever her name is ha allegedly has ties to QAnon, according to detractors okay but is popular with filling the blank because i actually would you know want to say both sides are possible whether i like the person or not you can say okay they're very controversial it's a very controversial mm -hmm. figure who has come under yeah, fire worth for it. posts and things on Facebook that people have accused her of, if that makes sense. Yes. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Well, and and here's this is interesting. Uh, when they're talking about Jack Dorsey, they have him quoted here regarding the decision to ban Trump, and he says that we did not mm-hmm. celebrate or feel pride in our having to ban at real Donald Trump from Twitter or how we got here. While there are clear and obvious exceptions, I feel a ban is a failure of ours ultimately to promote healthy conversation and a time for us to reflect on our operations and the environment around us. Now, when I read that, I had two thoughts. The first is what do they mean by promoting healthy conversation? And is that just another Mm -hmm. term for more censorship? Right. And so, but on the other hand, I will give him credit for at least saying maybe we played a role in getting to the point where people are using our platform um, and and have become so antagonistic towards each other. And I just, I wish that, I actually have an upload scheduled for tomorrow about two videos that have been released, separate um, sort of news organizations, two separate videos talking directly to the viewers about the post-election um, ethos. And one is like, basically, you dumb viewers, if you don't believe us, then that's your problem. <laughs> and the other is, you know what? I'm sorry for our role. Like, I'm sorry I'm sorry for our role in the fact that you don't believe us anymore. And that we've gotten to the point where people are so skeptical of what journalists are saying that even when there's an emergency and we really need to talk to you all about what's going on, we, we have lost all credibility. And I was like, that's awesome. You know? And so I don't know if Jack's being genuine or not here, but if he's even having a little bit of self, separ- no, no. Okay. Watch him, watch him with Tim pool a year ago. No, the reason why I'm saying is watch him with Tim pool twice on, uh, or he was on Joe Rogan once by himself. Joe Rogan had more, you know, he's, um, uh, God, what do you call that? Uh, uh, people will downvote or, or comment over it. I, I forget what the term is, but essentially he got beat up more on the first Jack Dorsey appearance than any other guest in history. And then he brought back uh, Tim Pool, and Jack Dorsey came with his lawyer. This is all well over a year old. We're talking about 2019. And all of these commentary, you know, all of this Dorsey has set. So he likes to play it against both sides and I'll I'll criticize the other side too, but he likes to say, boom, boom, boom. He makes all these moves, screws all the people over and goes, well, yeah, I guess that's our failing. I just did everything I wanted to do. I did every maneuver I wanted to do, but it's a failing. Meanwhile, you know, he goes on and does everything the same way as Ted Cruz will call him in front of Congress and Everybody will watch Ted Cruz and say, yeah, that's so cool. Look at him. He's really tearing into Jack Dorsey. And meanwhile, so what legislation is coming out of it? What actual action is taking place? No, it's just you know a little bit of red meat for the masses. Everybody get a dopamine hit because you're watching him, you know, chew into the guy you don't right. like. But meanwhile, business as usual. But I'm a little cynical on some of it. Yeah, and I think you have good reason to be because I, it's the same reason that I'm cynical about uh, the calls for suppressing Trump, for instance, after making tons of money off of him. And it's like, well, he's gone now, so we'll just we'll let we'll let him out the back door. But we made every last cent off of him that we possibly could. So if you cared about him, like it, the, the media and and just all the 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 coverage and just the constant fascination and and then just saying that we, you know, we had no role in the building up of, of where we're at. I just, but, but, but we were fine with, with getting the ratings and the money that came along with it. Um, and Bob said that Hanlon's razor makes good sense in everyday life though. When it comes to politics, intelligence agencies, cults, con men, lawyers, and sociopaths, you have to account for the probability they're relying on the razor as a shield to mask their evil, as well as I'm so glad you're into Cheryl. I was seriously going to buy her books. I, and I, I've liked everything that I've read of Cheryl's like on social media and stuff, but I have not read her books yet. I do have something that she, she wrote a note, a friend of mine went to a book signing a while ago and got her to write a note to me that says, uh, Allison keep holding or keep speaking truth to power. That's what she wrote. So I still have that note, which is pretty cool. Maybe someday I'll get to meet her. You've had her on your podcast. Right. So I have, yes. So everybody needs to go watch that. I, I need to get her. If I can get her again, I'll try to get her on with you. That would be kind of cool. Um, 
that would be, yeah, that would be amazing. So, all right, I'm just going to go through a few of these. How many Barnes helped her with her taxes? Barnes helped her with her taxes? I'm hoping he does. Um, she's having some problems. He volunteered to uh, help on Twitter. We could go into a whole... He's a good guy to help you out. We could go into a whole <laughs> other conversation about the government and the benefits the government gives you and then how they come back and screw you on the tax side of things where you're like, you know what? I wish I had never taken your, your benefits ever. Like, but that's a, that's a conversation for another day. Um, I'm a high end geek by trade. I can tell you as a factual matter, there's no need for censorship to be imposed on us for good combos. If people want it, make it opt in technically easy to do. It's kind of what, what the sure. platforms like locals are trying to do. Right, Eric. Well, yeah, locals. I mean, if you if you have to pay to be there, then obviously you're self-selecting to begin with. That that's a message you agree with. I haven't asked Barnes about. It. I'm going to as well. I'm wondering if there's even more coverage there, where you know how um, cable TV can have risque content on it that normal television broadcast can't have because people have to pay in order to subscribe. I'm wondering if locals may be, you know, protected a little bit mm -hmm. more because, hey, you know what? You're paying to be there. So if there's offensive content and you're paying, well, you you opted in. You you took um, a further action than just showing up. So I don't know if that will protect it even more because I'm, I'm nervous for every alternative channel. I don't know if anybody's completely safe. Yeah. Well, and what is alternative nowadays? Did, oh, that was another thing I was going to show everybody, but hang on a second. Um, another book recommendation by Courtney Grace. So you've been publicly shamed by John Ronson. I have a spare copy. Ronson. I'll mail you or Eric, whoever has more space in their reading list. Have you already read that? Already read it, yep. Oh, okay. I guess multiple. you're sending it to me. <laughs> um, oh, so this guy says Barnes is one that pisses me off. I'm guessing, I don't know, that must be, are you a Trump supporter? Because... <laughs> Barnes got a lot of hate when he came out and said that Trump left like a coward, right? He hate. Um, well, Barnes, he didn't really go into that, but um, he gets a lot of um, a a lot of people who like QAnon. That you know, they're upset with him going hard at um, at Linwood. A lot of people upset with him going hard at QAnon. I don't know if that's the case here. I mean, Bar Barnes is a a very confident individual. He is, he does not lack certainty. So he may rub some people the wrong way because he's a very, very certain what, guy. So uh, this is Dickie Welshman. I think what, what is it that you didn't like about uh, Barnes and keep going, Eric, just figure maybe he can clarify. Oh, cause says he got, gets law wrong. That was part of his former business. Someone else says, I love, a, a of I love Barnes. I love Barnes. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. Dickie may, Dickie, are you a fan of, uh, of, uh, Nate, the lawyer or Nate Brody? Because there's no, a conflict a between with... Nate Brody about the states versus, uh, uh, Pennsylvania and Barnes. Uh, they're on opposite sides of that. Fred, Fred believes Linwood. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking that that could be it. I don't know the details mm -hmm. though. Like I said, he's a very certain guy. Well, I, I have really enjoyed listening to him because he's he's got a very different take on a lot of stuff, but also has the the credibility, the background, and the knowledge to talk about it. He's not just some person, like, speculating about... Like me. Yeah, like me, too. <laughs> you know, like I would be if I were talking about some of this stuff. So, so I was interested in hearing his read on the election, for instance, because... I didn't hear a whole lot of other lawyers talking about it. You heard politicians talking about it. You heard YouTuber partisans talking about it, mainstream media, journalists, whatever. But I didn't hear a lot of constitutional law people talking about what was going on that had, you know, different opinions. And so I appreciated hearing what he had to say. Um, but, I, you know, I know he because of that, he has a following of people who really like Trump. And then when he was like, you know, he should have pardoned Assange and all this stuff. And then, you know, he he basically went with the Mitch McConnell way of doing things when he left and he left um, with his tail between his legs. And I think people didn't like it when he said that. 
I don't know. I'm not. Yeah, I wasn't impressed with that either. I, I did want him to pardon Assange, but okay. I, I it sounds like I was right. Yes, on Nate, on Viva, on Civil. I don't care about their personal beefs or disagreements. I, you know, honestly, like Nate and Barnes, they disagree, but you know, Nate's the first one to tell you he'll hire Barnes, and if he needs a lawyer. And then there's the Alex Jones connection because Barnes is friends with Alex Jones. <laughs> there is a crazy Alex video Jones circulating right now of Alex Jones, which says a lot if it's a crazy Alex Jones video talking about. I don't even think I can say it on the channel. QAnon? No, it's about uh, some. Gay fraud. I don't. You know what? I'm not even going to go there. I'll text it to you afterwards. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> I did want to. I wanted to bring up um, this other web story that i had here oh hang on a second where did it go okay um okay so this is really interesting because a lot of people talk about the censorship stuff being from the right but actually the folks who have been paying attention to this on the left who are concerned which frankly there are a lot of people on sort of the establishment mainline left that i think are the ones driving the pro lockdown of you know suppression of information but there are people on the left that are that are sort of social critics establishment critics um you know as you said at the beginning right exactly like it's it's not really right versus left anymore you said it's kind of what top versus bottom or something like that and yeah top versus bottom. have you taken the political compass before no the political compass says left and right and then top is authoritarian and bottom is libertarian okay so when when you you hear top versus barbarian, you know, authoritarian versus libertarian, and the right and the left can be taken out of that mix in a lot of ways. Because sometimes the people on the right and the left who are very libertarian kind of agree on, let's say, 85%. Isn't John everything. Brennan saying that libertarians are now domestic terrorists or something like that? Uh, I heard yeah. that quote that he's like, Talking. we, yeah, he's like runs through all these things and he's like, terrorists and this and that. And he's like, and libertarians, you know, <laughs> so like what? Right. <laughs> we, you think that wasn't deliberate? No, I'm that, sure it was. In? I'm sure it was. But Tulsi. That's a re education. Yeah, Tulsi. Yeah, well, I see what you're saying. Yeah, Tul Tulsi brought that up in her video. So I'm showing this link. Uh, it's, a, it's a press release. Facebook shuts down major left wing group in Britain. Uh, Facebook has shut down the accounts of one of the biggest left wing organizations in Britain, the Socialist Workers Party. The Socialist Workers Party Facebook That's page. Happened. Yeah. And, and they got, I think they got everybody railed on them for it. So they reinstated their account so it says statement facebook bows to pressure now reinstate the rest of the accounts where they talk about okay so after complaining so so i saw jimmy Dore do this video because he was talking about it as well that like here they are they're coming for the left too so if you think that oh you yeah. know because so, the left is the left has outlived their usefulness and that's what jimmy Dore warned against yeah um you're seeing antifa now they're cracking down on antifa for real so it's very interesting where, you know, a, a lot of people would agree that some of the things like CHOP and Chaz or whatever you want to call it, they sort of let a lot of this go for a while, but it's not acceptable now. We're no longer voting, so that's going to be shut down. And some of the uh, more extreme left-wing voices are also going to be shut down because they don't really need them any longer. Uh, Jimmy had an interview that was really interesting with a Boogaloo boy the other day. Boy? Yeah. And it was fascinating yep. how much they agreed on, <laughs> you know, and that's what you're, I really th feel like I, I said that in one of my, my recent videos, like you, you're the sort of left, right thing is not working anymore. And, and the tactics of the, the, the fringe on either side or the extreme on either side, they're starting to look the same. The ideologies are not super different. And even those people who aren't necessarily on the fringe or the extreme, uh, action side of it, the ideologies are starting to sound kind of similar too. that, that like, we're basically getting screwed by the establishment and, and we may have, well, they are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it's crazy uh, to hear locals. I actually shared, I, I shared a video of, a uh, of proud boys and BLM talking mm -hmm. and going, wait, what? Yeah. You know, I, and just getting along fine because it's like, no, I don't have any problem with you. You know, the proud boys telling BLM, no, I got no problem with you. You're right, man. And we totally support you because, you know, BLM's got to, because if black lives don't matter, then other lives aren't going to matter. You got to go first. I got it, man. And we, and they're going, what, what? And it's like, 
oh, they're in the same neighborhood, they grow up together and everything else. That's the last thing anybody establishment wise yeah. wants to happen yeah. because guess what? They don't disagree. It, Reagan, I think, said something like, uh, if we're 85 percent in agreement you're not like 15 percent my enemy or some mm-hmm. garbage I, I forgot what it was I gotta look that no up. but that you're right like when when you have both sides finally uniting that's that's a lot of people uh <laughs> that that are gonna have to be contended with um that that the this sort of party uh infighting and the stuff that you know, who was it? Um, I think it was in Rand Paul's speech where he was talking about like Trump is the boogeyman for Congress so that they don't actually with the impeachment again, so that they don't have to actually deal with the fact that there are things that the American people need to be done. And it's just another show of of ideological uh I don't want to call it force, but it's just a, it's just theatrics. That was what he was saying, so that they don't have to really deal with the fact that there's sure. some serious policy issues that that especially with covid and the economy healthcare whatever else it is that need to be need to be discussed that they, that they get to just keep and i think the the media is kind of in that way too it's like you don't have to do real journalism investigative journalism and tackle hard topics if you can just keep you know filling time and space with this guy the last thing i wanted to bring up before you go eric is this blog from YouTube they just released about Susan Wojcicki saying their 2021 priorities. And she talks about the regulatory landscape where she discusses dealing with Europe, for instance, and their Digital Services Act and Section 230. So she says, there has recently been significant debate on 230, which enables us to both keep YouTube open and allow a large amount of content on the internet, as well as take the actions necessary to protect our platform. Both sides of the political spectrum are interested in modifying it, but there are diametrically opposed views on the problem and a lack of consensus on what should be done. So that's something to look ahead for. Not sure what's going to happen there. Definitely. Um, By the way, I found the quote. Okay. And I I think it's a strong one from Reagan. The person who agrees with you 80% of the time is a friend and an ally, not a 20% traitor. I like that. I like that. I texted you, so oh, you good. have it for later. There it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll have to. I'll. Uh, I'll have to. Um, I have to make a list of my favorite quotes because I, I haven't done that over the years. When I was in journalism, I should have written down in a journal all of the crazy stories too, and the quotes that I got from interviews and stuff. And I never kept a journal, and I'm so mad at myself because I had talked to the like most amazing and weirdest people on the face of the earth. I talked to this guy once I did an interview. Literally, this is just, maybe this is a good place. And I'll go through a couple more chats in a second, but, um, this one time in Florida, which I'm sure, as you know, Eric has taught, uh, Lynn and I about the, um, benefits of ending every night with the good place on Netflix. If you guys haven't heard of it, but fantastic. It is. Um, (laughs) And they won't let anyone from Florida in heaven, I'm pretty sure, or so, something like that. And um, I'm from Florida, of course, so that doesn't bode well for me in my afterlife. But so I was reporting in Florida, and this guy drove by our live truck with signs on the side of his van that said the world was ending. And it was there was this thing happening. I, it was probably ah, ten, maybe 10 years ago, nine years ago, there was a the world is going to end on this day thing. And it was happening around the country. But of course, Florida was a hotbed for it. So I said to the photographer, I had a t-shirt crossed out every date and a whole list of you did? time. Yes. That's one of my favorites. That's awesome. All the way through 2012, the Mayan calendar. Um, okay. So that must've been what it was. So yeah. So I like hit the gas, you know, so we speed down 275 and no, but following the law, of course, but also speeding and then pull up next to the guy. And I'm like, pull over pull over this is how I got all my stories pull over so the guy's like what right. and because he thought the world was ending I guess he didn't mind pulling over for some crazy lady in a news truck so he did and I got out of the truck on the side of the highway with cars zooming past me and I was like do you really believe the world's gonna end on this day and he's absolutely and he runs me through things like, would you do an interview about it sure so I call my bosses you know I'm gonna switch stories I'm interviewing this guy about the, the ending of the world because in Florida 
those stories sold. So my bosses didn't care that I probably was going to skip a city council meeting for that. And so I, I interviewed him, right? So we did this whole story. He was handing out flyers to people. And the, the cool thing, though, was that I got to follow up with him after it didn't mm-hmm. end. And that was my favorite interview, actually. Like, one of my favorites of all time was talking to somebody who was like... Is it online? I don't think so anymore. Because they switch web providers all the time. Yeah. I should have kept it. See, this is another one of these things. But these are the things I used to do every what? day, Eric. Like, every day I talk to people like this. Which is why I literally have no... People are like, I don't know if you're going to want to hear what this person has to say. Or I don't know if I can introduce you to my Aunt Jean or my Uncle Frank. They're all they're crazy. And I, I don't know what that means anymore. I literally do not know what a crazy person is anymore. Because Well, you're like, good. Good, yeah, I, I'm think. bored by normal people. I hate. I, I get so bored by people who just talk about their degrees. Or I'd much rather sit down and talk to a guy who thinks the world's gonna end tomorrow. Okay, here's a chat. Uh, Tuno. Speaking of which, have you heard of uh, Florida and Germany? No. I, I, I will shut up after that. But uh, Adam Carolla actually does it, but it's pretty funny. They read a, a goofy news story that'll involve any kind of odd sex acts. Uh, weapons or something else and he has to guess whether it's Florida or Germany because all the weird stuff is always in one of those two places yeah (laughs) okay yeah I mean I believe it Florida is just kind of known for that what can we say Um, okay so I did buy one MP via Walmart and now own three they are great sometimes you'll feel the need to be hypocritical I mean what is an MP what does that mean Eric I did buy one MP via Walmart I don't know what that is Bob, we're easier to control when we're ignorant and confused and divided. Best not to think too hard about ethical consistency. Best not to think too hard about ethics. Best not to think too hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe the left in Congress are using impeachment as screen, people paying attention to it rather than what Biden is doing to weaken economy and country in general. Um, yeah. Of course, Florida, because Florida. Yes. <laughs> Mayan's got it backward. It's 2021 when the world ends. Yes, <laughs> probably. Let's see. Uh, the world is going to end tomorrow. Let's chat. Well, I hope everybody had a good uh, censorship happy hour. I don't know if we talked entirely about censorship, but we definitely touched on it. Is there anything else censorship wise, Eric, that you would like to discuss before we censor our awakeness by going to sleep? Zip. <laughs> I I will say that I, I, I'm just trying to run through the things that I wanted to make sure we did talk about journalism. We talked about editorializing. We talked about uh, people that make us uncomfortable virtue signaling. I mean, I think I think we talked a lot about a lot of stuff. I hope everybody had fun. I'm really appreciative of Eric. We should all give him a a, um, well, thank a standing you. ovation or I can't stand because then I will be out of the frame of the camera. But I really appreciate it. Eric, again, um, <laughs> c- can you give us any sneak peeks into who we can see on your channel coming up soon. Sure. Uh, I talked about mind control tomorrow. I have chase Hughes on who is, uh, the author of the ellipsis manual and, uh, I don't have it up here. Okay. The ellipsis manual. He's all about mind control, body language, reading, things like that. He's part of the behavior panel Monday. We were talking about censorship. Now I'm going to have Eric Kleinsmith on. He was part of a project in front of Congress, but he'll talk about military use of censorship as uh, psyops operations, things of that sort. Then, what do I have? Oh, next uh, live stream next Thursday, I have Viva and Barnes back with Greg Hartley and Scott Rouse of the behavior panel. So I have behavior panel experts and Viva and Barnes, you know, top lawyers at the same time. And Friday, I have uh, Chris Hadnacki, who's one of the top social engineering human hackers in the world. Wow, that sounds like a good one. I mean, the other ones do too, of course. But, you know, now that I've already been on chats with Viva and Barnes and everything, I'm like, they're very yesterday. Yeah, yeah, me, yeah. You know? they're, old, they're old hat. <laughs> um, how, are you allowed to tell us how you know them? I've, I've always wanted to ask you that. I don't, I don't mean to ask you that on live YouTube for the first time, but are you allowed to tell us? Um, how, did, how did you all meet? Sure. Well, oddly enough, I kind of introduced them to each other in some ways. Oh, really? So, yeah, I had Scott Rouse on uh, my podcast. The, the, there was a podcast from 
2018, uh, March 2018, all the way till well now, but I focus more on YouTube. So everybody, Eric Hundley on YouTube, subscribe, please. <laughs> anyway, um, I had Scott Rouse on. I had Mark Bowen, uh, Bowden on, or Bowden on, um, and we talked with each other. Scott Rouse is a huge nerd, and actually, it's his book up up there about body language. And and Chase Hughes is an intense nerd in terms of he went to G.W. Westbrook, who was part of um, MK Ultra. He was one of the professors that ran the program. And he literally wrote about going there and going through three cubic feet of material. So this guy is such a nerd that he talks about his, his media, you know, his reading consumption in cubic feet. That's pretty And nuts. I was like, okay, let me put them together. That put, I put Scott with him, and ultimately, with COVID and them together, they were like, hey, uh, we like hanging out together. We do this body language stuff. Nobody else can deal with us anyway. Let's, let's talk about Tiger King. And they did a video, and that started that whole channel. So that's sort of why uh, I... Who's going to get Tiger I King on first, you or me? By the way, who's huh? going to get Tiger King? Remember that? Tiger King? You just I know oh, it wasn't like, what you were talking about, but didn't you just say Tiger exotic? King? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually talked to somebody who, you know, all the footage, like her arm getting ripped off in Tiger yeah. King? I, I was talking to that guy about having him on, but I, I passed and sent him to somewhere, someone else. You didn't want to have that person on? It just didn't... <laughs> I, I didn't feel like it, it was working at the time with what I was doing. I, <laughs> because I know it would have gotten a, ma like, a million I, not, views. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it will or not. It, it just, it, it wasn't fitting the, you know, the sequence there. It's kind of weird. Yeah. And Joe exotic is in jail in jail. Yes. Busha Busha. Um, um <laughs> but that, that, anyway, that's how I, how I met them. And, and David, uh, Viva, I've known David since he was, at, I don't know, 70, 50 to 70,000 subs or whatever. I just liked what How he did and got that? him on the podcast. 2019. So I He's had really him on a couple then, times. Huh? And yeah, yeah. And we just got on really mm -hmm. well. So it's kind of, you know, I, I, I've i known him then. And now he's at uh, 345, 345. Yeah. Somewhere he's in there. really exploded. Deserve it. Yeah, yeah. And then Barnes just you know, kind of through that, but we, we get yeah. along and I, I treasure that. And it's I'm all about relationships. And you've been a really great, um, buddy, you know, YouTube buddy since you and I connected Thank too, you. because yeah, it's just nice to have people who know this world because it can be kind of nuts, right. Dealing with all the things like it, it's, it's both something you pour your heart into, but it's also a business, but it's also a community. It, it's just a very weird space. So there it's like, it's very hard to just talk to somebody who doesn't do this, even though they'll give you advice or whatever. Sure. But, but if the people who are like in the game on this one, they only, they really know what it's like to put yourself out there like this and, and then deal with everything that goes along with it. And Courtney, I would really like to hear your perspective on the Keystone XL pipeline or pipelines in general and their environmental aspects. It's, that's a good topic. I'll, I'll think about um, doing a video on that because I think it probably is something that I could give a little bit of insight into. And so thank you for the suggestion. I will, I'll, I'll work on that. Um, and then to no spam, love a little syndical. I am well beyond that. Cynical, maybe you meant to say. I don't know. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is happy hour. Damn it. I watch Viva so on 1.75 speed. Weird. That's pretty How? fast. How is that possible? I know. I also love you Nick Ricada. Because he, sp he speaks at that Yeah, speed. he speaks really fast. Um, Viva's channel just exploded. I love Viva. Oh, Nick's yeah. awesome. Alice has been on with Nick. I've been on with Nick, Viva, and Barnes. What's up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you all were here at the beginning. Uh, oh, yeah, Eric, where is Cleopatra? How do we get her here, Lynn says. <laughs> If, if you're watching Cleopatra, let us know you're here. I don't know. That's it's funny because um, she's uh, she, she's a viewer that's on uh, Viva and Barnes a lot and then moved over to Eric when yeah, he had them on. It's, 
And she gives like $100 super chats. And we love you, Cleopatra, even if you never gave a $100 super chat. But it's just, I've never it's seen anybody. With Eva and Barnes on my if anybody watches their live streams, you know exactly what we're talking about because those big money super chats come in and we're like, damn. <laughs> like she single handedly keeps them afloat, I think. Um, so anyway, shout out to all of the generous super chatters because you do keep people like us going. Oh, no. Yes. Thank yeah. You. All right. Well, Eric, thanks again. And um, we appreciate you guys. Thanks, everybody, for thanks. the super chats. We will see you tomorrow. Um, who, final question uh, Who is going to interview Trump, Allison or Eric? Who has access? I'd jump Good for point. it. point. I jumped. I'd interview Alex Jones. Joe tomorrow. Rogan said he's not going to probably have Trump on. I saw him saying that in a recent stream. That's too bad. Yeah, I, I think it would be interesting to see that conversation. I kind of wonder why he is not. He said, what's the point? That was his answer to it. What's the point? Like, I don't know. I'd be interested to hear of that conversation. And uh, I am. yeah, and someone's saying here, too, that uh, I'd love to have Obama on, too, by the way. I mean, if it's a president of the United States. Yeah. I would love to. Have I don't. I don't say no to real. anybody, really. I, I. I'll be honest with you guys. Like, you could pitch me anybody, and I pretty much talk to him. I don't. I don't. I rarely say no. I. Yeah, you know, I'm here. I'm proof. <laughs> you should see my husband. I mean, I rarely say no, right? Right, Lynn? No, that was mean. I shouldn't say that. Donald, have you tried DMT? Final comment. That's probably not what we should add on. But thank you guys, everybody. Have a great night. Um, and Eric and I, don't forget to go over to Eric's channel, subscribe. And thanks again for all the super chats. Thanks for the support. And uh, I'll see you with a new video tomorrow on my, my two videos that I mentioned earlier about the way to repair journalism in the Biden era and the way to continue screwing it in the Biden era. And here's to whatever drink you're drinking. I'm going to finish my Malbec and... I'm going to call it an early night. Bye, everybody.